All right, welcome everyone. My name is Ethan Bott, and I am here to today to talk about the monarch butterfly, uh, one of the most iconic. Uh, do you want to turn off your camera and yourself? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, one of the most iconic insects in the United States, uh, well known for its wondrous migration and its wondrous beauty. Um, and uh, this, as Tim said, this is the uh, sequel to last year's uh, Monarch NATO lecture that Tim did just about a little less than a year ago. Um, so I am going to replay his lecture from last year. So enjoy. <laughs> just kidding. Um, I actually, I went through the liberty of watching his lecture. So I am here to share all new content about Monarch Butterfly. Um, and as Tim said in his lecture last year, there is so much to talk about the Monarch Butterfly. You could have a whole series of lectures just on uh, the one uh, uh, species. Um, so there, uh, we should probably do a lecture on this every, every year. Um, so I have a lot of fun stories to talk about, uh, but I first want to kind of, uh, recap uh, some of the basics before we move on uh, into some of the, the good stuff. Um, so monarch butterflies uh, fall into the order Lepidoptera, uh, meaning scaly wings. Um, a couple fun facts about why or why not they have scales on their wings. Um, as you can see here of this macro photo of a monarch butterfly um, is that the they think the scales might kind of create some dead air, all these micro dead air pockets um, beneath each uh, scale, which helps provide more lift and which allows for them to migrate thousands of miles at times. Um, so uh, it may be an evolutionary advantage having these tiny little scales. Um, and there's also a debate about whether it helps them to get out of spider, um, spider um, webs. Um, or not because they can lose scales and still survive. Um, so that could be um, a, a reason why they have scales, but they are in the scaly wing um, uh, order. Um, so what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? Um, uh, I'll go through these quite quickly. So we have uh, the monarch butterfly here, they hold their wings at rest uh, together. And we have moths here holding their wings uh, apart at rest. We typically have butterflies flying through the day and moths at night. Um, and as Tim said last year, uh, these are all general, uh, these are all general alities that sometimes you do have moths flying during the day. Um, here is kind of a more close-up zoom of a of, uh, butterfly and of a moth. Uh, one of the key features is the antennae uh, look a little bit different between a butterfly uh, and a uh, moth. You kind of have this feathery structure here, typically on moths, and you kind of have a club shape on a butterfly. Um, and you can get a better view here of these two, uh, of a moth and a butterfly. Uh, so the, uh, they're very quite different. Um, this one actually don't, is this a, I think there's a luna moth actually here on the left. Um, so super, super cool. Uh, and then here's a cheat sheet. Uh, if, uh, you want to write those down and remember them in the future. Um, uh, some other ones are the caterpillars of moths are fuzzy, hairy, or smooth, and butterfly caterpillars are smooth or spiky. Um, and then the body size is also a little different between butterflies and moths. So that's the difference between a moth and a butterfly. And now it's time to tell the difference between male and female monarch uh, butterflies. Um, so as this graphic shows, uh, we have a male on the top and a female on the bottom. And the defining characteristic is that uh, uh, that black spot on the, the, the hind wings of the male, these are actually release pheromones during courtship uh, to attract females. Um, and uh, so if you get a view, if, they're, if they do hold their wings open at rest, uh, you may be able to get a, a view of this defining uh, characteristic of this butterfly. Also, males typically have thinner veins um, and females have thicker uh, veins. Um, this lecture is kind of all to get uh, us excited about monarchs as we are, are tagging them uh, right now at this time. Um, and so kind of to drum up support and hopefully you all come out for that. 
Um, but also one of the first things you have to do is identify if it's a male or a female in Monarchae. Um, so it's important to be able to tell the difference between a male and female monarch of the tribe. All right, another classic example uh, that you will want to identify, and we actually had this happen yesterday on a survey, um, you need to be able to differentiate between a monarch and its counterpart, the viceroy. Uh, the viceroy is not really related to the monarch butterfly as closely. They look so similar, so you think they'd be really, really closely related, but they actually aren't. Um, but uh, to be able to determine the difference between the two um, is you're looking for this kind of black, thin black line on the viceroy that kind of follows the, the edge of the wing um, uh, just a tad bit in, and you don't have that on either the male or female monarch butterfly. Um, so we had a great example of this yesterday on during monarch taking. We're like, oh, we have a monarch butterfly. And as we uh, took it out and it kind of opened up its wings, like, right? ah, that is a viceroy because we saw this nice uh, thin black line. However, in flight, it can be hard to identify the difference between a monarch and a viceroy. Um, but you can kind of tell uh, because viceroys uh, kind of have a flatter flight pattern um, and uh, monarch butterflies kind of fly with a V in shape. Um, uh, and they're kind of like a lazy erratic flight for a monarch and a viceroy is a little bit of a quicker, faster erratic flight. Um, so it's important to know, again, the difference between a viceroy and a monarch butterfly. Um, and so this is an example of a type of mimicry. I want to kind of uh, talk about these two types of mimicries. Uh, uh, we have Mullerian mimicry or Bayesian mimicry. Um, and for years and years and years, um, uh, we thought of an example of, of uh, Bayesian mimicry where the viceroy was taking advantage of the, uh, uh, um, the toxins within the monarch butterfly. Predators knew they wouldn't eat a monarch because it would make them sick. And we thought viceroys were taking advantage of this and they actually weren't toxic themselves. Um, but uh, in the past uh, few years, uh, we have found out that viceroys um, are toxic in some levels. And it kind of depends on the region where you are in the United States. Um, but uh, viceroys are are technically toxic as well. And so this now becomes an example of malarian mimicry where both uh, uh, species are able to kind of benefit each other. As in Bayesian mimicry, you had one uh, species uh, taking advantage of the other um, per se. Um, so um, yeah, pretty cool. Um, uh, uh, mimicry between the two. Probably one of the more well-known mimicries too between two species, at least in the United States, um, in my opinion. All right, I'm gonna quickly go through the uh, life cycle of a uh, monarch butterfly very briefly. You could do a whole lecture probably in the life cycle, but I'm gonna breeze through this. Uh, so it starts out as, a, out as an egg on milkweed, right? So only, uh, they can only be laid on milkweed plants for the monarch butterfly. Um, it then becomes uh, a, a larva uh, going through uh, five stages of what we call instar levels, um, going from a tiny little uh, nubbin uh, to a substantial uh, caterpillar. Um, and it goes into its pre-pupa stage, going into its classic J's, uh, J uh, shape um, before going uh, and creating its chrysalis, going into chrysalis. Um, and then uh, later emerging as an adult uh, butterfly. This whole process takes around like uh, around a month, depends on the time and uh, weather conditions. Um, and then like each instar level, there are five stages that takes around two to three days as it slowly eats a ton of uh, milkweed, uh, it'll uh, increase, it'll get bigger and bigger. Um, so that's a very brief uh, overview of the life cycle of a monarch. Um, and then once it is a monarch butterfly, um, it's, uh, it can uh, survive um, for uh, a few weeks. Um, and then you'll find out that the super generation can survive for much longer. I want to share a quick video here of a caterpillar eating. Um, I can't embed videos into my, uh, uh, into my PowerPoint, so I have to do it this way. But I just want to show how uh, ferocious of an eater. Are. There's no sound on it, um, but it's had to work. 
it like reminds me of when I eat a hamburger and I'm just chowing down on that hamburger. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> it's just cool. They just eat so much. They just don't stop eating. So pretty cool. All right. I should probably pause this first before I share my PowerPoint. All right. So, oh yeah, there's YouTube link. Uh, so, moving on to the milkweed, uh, this is uh, synonymous with the uh, uh, monarch butterfly um, for, for many reasons. As we know, the, uh, um, the sap has toxins uh, that, call, that it contain cardenoloids, um, which are um, uh, a type of steroid. Um, and I didn't do too much research in this, um, but it, it seems like it, it can cause uh, heart problems uh, in people, but it's also used uh, in to, for heart failure. I know um, there are a couple of people on this call who probably know more about this than me. Um, it seems ironic that it could be used for both uh, to hurt someone and also help someone, but I'm sure there are different forms and types of it. But uh, in terms of insects and birds and such like that, uh, it is poisonous. Uh, uh, as the instars ingest the milkweed, they ingest the poison, and therefore the birds and their predators uh, find them distasteful. Um, so uh, this is this common milkweed here is in the broadleaf family, but we also have uh, what we call the narrow-leafed uh, group of milkweeds, um, and this is the world milkweed. Um, this is uh, a type of milkweed that is actually quite a bit more toxic than the uh, common milkweed. Um, and that actually happens to be a little bit more uh, tasty and um, uh, um, for, for livestock, livestock and horses, it looks like a nice meal. Um, and uh, that can be unfortunate for some livestock and horses uh, as uh, this has accounted for quite a few livestock deaths. Um, because they eat too much of this and they, they can't die. Um, uh, a fun little fact is that a thousand pound horse uh, would have to eat two to three pounds of the world uh, milkweed to die. Um, so uh, it, it's kind of a lot, but not that much to eat um, for it to, to cause uh, uh, to die. Um, also on the, 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 the narrow leafed milkweeds, uh, it's a different type of toxin, actually, too, uh, that uh, attacks of uh, 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 attacks of nervous system. Uh, wait, did I get that right? Um, that attacks the the, uh, the nervous system, and the common milkweed attacks the kind of the heart. Um, so, kind of interesting different uh, variations of the toxin toxins between uh, two milkweed uh, species. All right, uh, so again, here we have a common uh, milkweed, healthy looking uh, leaf, um, but there's uh, a problem that milkweed can face um, uh, uh, anywhere in the United States, but especially in cities, and that would be ground level ozone. Um, ground level ozone is created by uh, car exhaust, power plants, uh, energy plants, uh, just city life. Um, and it can become trapped in cities, especially um, depending on the topography uh, and the weather of that city. Um, and uh, milkweed serves as a great bioindicator of the health of uh, the, the environment um, because they face relatively few pests and diseases. They're relatively pest and disease free plant. Um, and so, uh, this is a somewhat blurry photo, but it shows uh, a common milkweed that has been affected by uh, ground level ozone kind of creating all these uh, black little holes. Uh, the ozone actually um, uh, penetrates, goes into the stomata of the leaf, uh, which uh, allows air and, and gases to go in and out of the plant. And it actually burns the leaf. Uh, the ozone actually burns it and creates these tiny little black dots. Uh, which hurts that actually hurts the milkweed. Um, and so uh, there's research that has shown that milkweed is an excellent uh, bioindicator of ozone um, uh, presence in the environment. 
Um, so if you do see this, that means that you are probably uh, in the midst of some ground level ozone. Um, so uh, this might have been more of an issue back when the ozone uh, um, uh, age happened. I forget when that happened. Um, maybe not more of an issue, but maybe more prevalent, maybe more people thinking about it then. Um, but I just wanted to share that uh, interesting thing. All right, another, uh, I want to share something else that is uh, synonymous with uh, milkweed plants, and that would be the red milkweed beetle. Uh, you, I always find this every single springish time around June on milkweed plants. Um, that's a lot of them are on there. Um, but this beautiful insect um, uh, eats quite a bit of milkweed as well. Um, however, they have a little bit of an evolutionary um, adaptation um, for eating milkweed. If they just ate, or if you ever uh, break the typical leaf of milkweed plant, you'll immediately see that sap start kind of flowing out. Um, and uh, if this uh, beetle started doing that, uh, that sap would get over its mouth parts. And the sap of the milkweed is actually kind of like a gooey latexy uh, substance. And it could actually, as it hardens, it can harden in like half an hour and it can completely close the mouth of the beetle, therefore killing it. Um, so what they developed is that they'll kind of cut the major veins of a leaf kind of closer towards the stem. Um, and then they'll move further away from the stem and eat the milkweed, the rest of the leaf uh, from there. Um, and by cutting off the veins, the sap won't flow there. And so they can enjoy a tasty uh, breakfast, lunch, or dinner without getting their mouth uh, glued uh, shut. So a uh, pretty cool adaptation by uh, this, this beetle that you so often see on, on milkweed plants. Oh, and then another fun thing is that if you squeeze um, or kind of rub, if you pick one up and you rub it between your fingers or you kind of see it flipped upside down or kind of stuck somehow, uh, they make this really kind of cool squeaking sound. I'm gonna share a video with you. All right, so listen closely. So for whatever reason, uh, they uh, make this uh, squeaking sound uh, and it's just pretty cool that they do that. So if you ever pass by and you see one, um, you can pick one up and, and give it a little uh, squiggle. And, Ethan, uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I heard that. Do you have- Oh, uh, are you not here? Oh, did shoot, I didn't share, share sound. I didn't share my sound. Okay, hold on. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Can you all hear that? I assume you can. Much, now. much better. All right, good. Sorry about that. All um, good thing the first video I showed you didn't have uh, sound uh, the caterpillar feeding, but this one did. So hopefully you could all hear that uh, nice uh, little squeaking sound that they produce. All right, uh, time to move into the migration of the monarch butterfly. Um, which allows uh, so many people to see the monarch butterfly from around the United States um, and what it's so well known for, one of the most iconic migrations too of any species here in the United States. Um, I'm gonna kind of briefly go over some parts of the migration. Um, uh, as, as some of us know, uh, they winter in Mexico. Uh, they spend uh, their winters there. And so all the monarchs you're seeing right about now are heading to one location down there in Mexico. And in springtime, early spring, uh, they will, um, um, the first generation will move north, say to Texas, uh, and lay their eggs uh, there. Those eggs will hatch and uh, then become adult butterflies. And they will move north to maybe say Iowa, and then they'll do that same process. And so you may have uh, three to four 
uh, generations moving north in a summer. Um, and then you'll have what we call the super generation going all the way back uh, from uh, parts of Canada or wherever in the United States back to uh, the wintering grounds in, in, in Mexico. Um, uh, this is the super generation is just, um, uh, uh, what we're seeing right now for the monarchs. Um, uh, some of the facts that uh, make them different from the um, uh, populations moving north during the summer is that typically these super generation monarchs are actually a bit bigger, a little bit beefier um, to allow them to give them more strength and power to go on that long journey home. Um, sometimes a couple of thousand of miles um, to get to their winter and grounds. Um, so you'll have uh, bigger monarchs. Uh, you'll also have um, uh, their reproductive um, uh, system is kind of put on pause um, when they emerge. Um, this saves a lot of energy and kind of elongates their, their life. Uh, if you remember from earlier, uh, um, monarch butterflies moving north live only like two to four to five weeks uh, in their adult stage. Um, and their goal is really just to breed and pass on um, uh, to create the next generation to move north. Uh, but that super generation, um, their reproductive system is kind of put on pause to elongate their life as they don't need to breed until six months, seven months later. Um, so that's uh, pretty interesting. Um, so how can we uh, identify um, if monarchs are heading south? Uh, I, one of the reasons is time of year. So depending on where you are, if you're further north, it starts around mid-August. Um, and then definitely later on into fall, uh, if you see monarchs, you know that they are heading down south. But another cool way, and if you've been able to witness this, you, you're pretty lucky and it's really cool to see, uh, to know if monarchs are typically heading south, um, is if you see a what we call a roost. Um, this is a low quality photo, but a high quality experience that I had last year, or maybe even two years ago in the Menominee Valley. Um, I happened to walk by and I saw a, my, I guess my first roost of monarch butterflies right around this time of year. Um, and basically a roost is just a group of butterflies uh, gathering in one place. Um, this was like latish morning, 9.30. Uh, in the morning that I saw this. Um, but this is very typical of migrating monarchs uh, heading south uh, during the, the evening. They'll kind of gather in these clusters um, at these specific places. So the question is, why do they roost? Um, one of the reasons they roost is uh, for predator protection, uh, kind of gathering into one place, kind of like a group of minnows or a group of starlings. Um, uh, but I think one of the main reasons that, that they do this is because of the microhabitat of that specific place, um, that this pr offers protection from the wind. Uh, there's a microhabitat of humidity, um, and there's a little bit more of a stable temperature in this exact location, say from this tree, from another tree. Um, monarchs need humid-ish conditions or they'll literally dry out. Insects can't, most insects need some level of, of moisture. Um, and so uh, uh, I get monarchs are cold blooded, so they're not necessarily roosting together to share their warmth because they don't use their own body heat. Uh, they're entirely dependent on the environment's uh, uh, temperature to dictate uh, their temperature. Um, so if you see a roost like this around this time of year, you know they're heading south. And another really interesting fact is that uh, they, uh, they need to be near a nectaring source because they need to eat a lot if they're migrating 100 miles every day, 50 to 100 miles every day. Um, and so they need to be close to the nectar source. And lo and behold, the Menominee Valley, there's a beautiful prairie there. And this was uh, just uh, 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 a few hundred feet away from a uh, nectar and source for them. Um, some people have described seeing a roost form kind of as a uh, monarch uh, highway. You just have monarchs coming all over in the evening and they all kind of just like come together into one area. So it's pretty cool. Here's another picture of a, uh, of a roost. Um, you can have large or small roosts. The one I saw was relatively small, maybe only a few couple dozen, um, but you can, uh, you can have hundreds of them. 
Uh, they could be there just for a night or a few nights. Um, and um, yeah, pretty cool to see. Oh, Monarch Airport, not a Monarch Highway. Both kind of sound pretty similar, both get the, the same vibe, but yeah, pretty cool to see a roost uh, form. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, they, uh, uh, the monarchs continue heading south for that super uh, uh, generation. Um, and they head to one specific area in Mexico uh, in the Sierra Madre, Madre um, mountain range. Um, and uh, they're heading to one location, um, typically it's around 11 or 12 uh, uh, specific spots. Uh, uh, within the, the butterfly reserve here. Um, and uh, they're heading to this mountain range um, and they're going to this specific place that's about two miles above sea level um, uh, because uh, it has a very specific humidity level there that allows them to survive through the winter. So it's all about the humidity and temperature. And so obviously if they're south, it's warmer, but also you get the right humidity I'm assuming because it's high, higher up and that you have the oceans on both sides, this creates this like perfect microhabitat, microclimate uh, for the butterflies to survive in this area um, uh, in Mexico. So that's where you have all the Eastern population, um, um, almost all coming to winter. I also wanted to touch on briefly on the Western population here. Um, uh, there is a Western and an Eastern population. Uh, the Western population is in major decline. It's declined 99%. Um, but that, you can do a whole other lecture just on the Western population of monarchs. But today I'm only talking about the Eastern population. All right. Um, and right, so the temperature is really important because uh, uh, if it's too cool, they're gonna have to use up their fat reserves that they've worked so hard to uh, uh, build up uh, on their migration down. Um, and so if they're forced to use that, they're, they're more likely to die. Um, so uh, having the right temperature and humidity is super important. And obviously this area is super prone to uh, environmental or climate change. Um, and so if you have a big storm or something happened, you could really drastically hurt the entire population of monarchs. Um, and so it's, it's definitely getting a lot of protection. Um, and there's a lot of focus on protecting this area. Um, and uh, I guess blame has been put on a specific area, but uh, for the population decline, but it's all our jobs, uh, they go all throughout the uh, United States, North America, and so it's all our jobs to make sure we're providing um, uh, food and nectar sources and uh, milkweed for them to lay their eggs. Um, so it's everybody's uh, job to get uh, to help them out. So this is an example of what it looks like uh, down in Mexico. Um, this is an example of a large uh, uh, roost of them. So there are about 11 to 12 of these that occur. You can just see that you can see the individual trees. You can just see how small uh, they are where all these monarchs are going. Um, you'll see kind of a slight orange uh, tinge to it um, that shows you all the monarchs. Um, and so you may wonder, how do you estimate the population size of monarchs? And what, how they do this is that the researchers will uh, mark trees. As you, as you walk through, you'll see the monarchs on the trees. And so you'll mark the trees that delineate the edge. And then you kind of go to this aerial imagery and you can then estimate uh, the acreage or the hectares um, uh, by doing that. Um, so uh, there are various ways of estimating how many monarchs are within one hectare. That's the unit of measurement they use. Um, and there's estimates from 10 to 50 million monarchs are in one hectare. Um, obviously it's impossible to count every single individual monarch. And so they have to use this kind of um, loose estimation um, to estimate the population every year. Uh, here is a couple more photos, a few more photos of what it looks like uh, down in Mexico. You just have everything dripping monarchs. Um, I was just actually uh, talking to a friend yesterday uh, who went on a trip with the UEC down, to, down here and uh, said it was obviously 
um, amazing and she was awestruck. Um, but uh, it's also kind of sad because there's so many live butterflies. There are also a lot of dead ones and there are a lot of dead monarchs on the ground. Um, and that researchers would literally shovel them up um, and take them back for analysis or look for any uh, monarch tags on them. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I just thought that was uh, pretty interesting. Okay, um, I wanna talk about a couple of the, um, uh, if there are millions, tens of millions of monarchs in one small location, uh, it seems like that would be an easy meal for a lot of uh, predators. Um, but thankfully they are poisonous, but not to all species. Uh, there are three uh, predators that monarchs face um, when they're overwintering, um, with one of them being the black-backed grosbeak. Um, the black-backed grosbeak uh, has a relative immunity to the, the poisons within the, the monarchs. Um, and uh, between these three species, they account for 15% of uh, the loss of the overwintering monarch population. Um, when, and so when you think of tens of millions of monarchs, uh, you have millions being lost to three species. So the black-backed grosbeak um, uh, is able to eat the abdomen of the monarch um, and actually doesn't even eat the wings um, and uh, is able to get away with it. Um, They'll actually typically go after males who are about 30% less toxic than females. Um, so they have relative immunity, again, uh, to monarchs. Um, the next species is the uh, black-backed oriole. Um, they have a little bit of a little uh, different adaptation. Um, they aren't necessarily immune to the poison of the, the, the monarch. Um, and so they actually create a slit in the abdomen and then they extract and eat the fatty reserves of the butterfly. Um, so modern butterflies, uh, they hold the, the, the poison on like uh, the skin of the abdomen, but on the inside is this fat gooey goodness. Um, and so the, the Oriole has, able, has been able to uh, uh, evolve to extract the, the fat without giving the poison. And then lastly, we have the black eared mouse uh, that can eat uh, about 37 monarchs a day, which is just crazy. Um, and they can eat the entire abdomen and then they will leave the, the, the wings behind. Um, so uh, these three species, again, account for 15% of the loss of the overwintering monarch population. And it's kind of a sad slide here, but I, it was just really interesting to see. In the top right, you, you can tell um, what species predated on the, the monarch based off of how it looks. So in the top right, you have the uh, black-backed grosbeak that can just eat the entire abdomen and it'll leave the wing. Um, and then you have on the bottom, you can't really see it's not a great photo, but that was a uh, 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 black-backed oriole that had slit the abdomen and removed the, the fatty reserves from the abdomen. And then you have the top left, uh, just a cache of wings left over um, from uh, the black-eared mouse that uh, just uh, ate a bunch of them and then, and then left the wings. Um, so uh, pretty interesting that you can identify the species that uh, ate it uh, based off of their remains. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, uh, monarch butterfly population falls to record low. Uh, I wanna talk about kind of the population collapse uh, briefly um, of 2013. 2014, it got a lot of attention in the news. Um, and I remember that, um, I'm not sure if you all did, um, but uh, basically what we have is here's a graph of the uh, number of hectares of butterflies. Again, that's how we kind of estimate population size is how many hectares of butterflies that we have um, uh, in the overwintering population. And you can see it's around uh, seven, nine, 18 was an anomaly, um, but then in 13, 14, when they do the count in uh, late, uh, I don't know when they exactly do it, maybe in like January or something, um, they uh, found that uh, they only had 0.67 hectares of monarchs overwintering um, uh, in their overwintering location 
Um, so it's just a drastic decline. Um, I'll talk about why this happened. But thankfully, we have seen an increase in the past few years from that kind of pretty dramatic, drastic drop in 13, 14. So I read several papers and, and things like that. So I'll kind of spare all the nitty gritty and say that the, the most important thing that led to the population decline um, was temperature and uh, drought. Uh, there is research that shows that you can have large impacts on the monarch population if the, the mean temperature uh, uh, strays either one degree below or above average, um, mainly because it affects the, the growing season for uh, milkweed and for other uh, native plants that provide it with food. Um, so in 2011, 2012, the United States, Southern United States faced extreme temperatures and had severe droughts. And so you had two consecutive years of uh, really harsh summers. It really hurt the population moving north, um, which then led to, after two years, you had very few making it back um, that final year. But thankfully, we've kind of seen a rebound um, of the overwinter overwintering population, which is uh, great. Um, OK, I got to share. Um, Hopefully you can all see this. I, I don't know if you're seeing my little screen bar here. Hopefully you can just read this all. The normalized difference vegetation index. As a GIS person, I got to bring in some terminology. Um, this is a way of estimating um, drought. Uh, there is, uh, you can use satellite imagery, what we call LIDAR kind of light detection um, sensory. Uh, and basically, uh, you are able to tell the greenness values of an, literally of an entire country. So here's my example, I'm using Mongolia um, year to year. Um, but uh, basically uh, you can tell the greenness of the entire country. So plants reflect light, um, rocks reflect light. And so basically you can tell if a landscape is barren landscape, if it's really lush and green, or if it's like, and therefore suffering from a drought. Um, so here in Mongolia, you can see that, um, I can't tell what years these are, but the more yellow you see that there, uh, there is more of a drought. Um, so uh, they, they, for the research, they use a normalized uh, difference vegetation index to determine how severe the drought was for the nation, for Texas, uh, things like that. So I just keep throwing that terminology. Um, here's this graph kind of showing some of those statistics leading into that 13, 14, uh, year. Um, so yeah, the mean temp was two to three degrees uh, for the upper Midwest. Um, let's see, um, the first sighting. So uh, over, yeah, overwintering went from four to two to one to 0.67 in 2014. Um, so, oh yeah, here's the NDVI. Um, uh, so it was point, so the normalized dif um, difference vegetation index is on a scale of negative one to one. Um, and around like 0.5, a bit above that, is like good, healthy-ish vegetation for the most part, depending on where you are. A, uh, a, a score of like 0.1 is like barren, rocky, icy landscape. So while it doesn't look that bad, 0.462 is pretty low. And so again, you have these two low years of, of vegetation, of food. Of, of places to lay their eggs. Um, but thankfully we've had then three years and I, I don't know what's going on, um, how good the, the score was. So I'll share that. I also wanna talk about this most previous um, <clears throat> migration. If you remember earlier this year in Texas, there is the ice storm that came, um, that uh, took Texas over in February, middle of February. Um, and at that time, there would be a lot of uh, plants beginning to grow, um, providing the first fuel and uh, stopping places for the monarch. And so there was a lot of concern about how that was going to impact the population uh, moving forward. Um, but thankfully, uh, the population hasn't been impacted too much from what we, from initial guesses, um, uh, due to uh, pretty good temperatures in the Oklahoma and Nebraska area. It's been pretty good uh, growing season. 
Um, however, Western Minnesota and those areas obviously has had drought, has had wildfires. And so that, that part of the population may be suffering, but overall the population doesn't seem to have suffered too much um, because timing is everything um, for the monarch butterflies as they move north. If they get to an area too soon, and there's, nine, there's no food, they're, go they're gonna die. Um, other, it's okay, uh, and I think this happened in this case, when they got there and there was food in the spring, there was food, but maybe the milkweed wasn't there. And they can hang around in the area, um, uh, gathering nectar, waiting for the milkweed to, to grow so they can lay their eggs. Um, so um, there's a really cool blog where they talk about um, how they think migration is gonna go each year and their updates and stuff. So um, yeah. All right, I want to share some of the data that we have collected here at the Urban Ecology Center. Um, this is our um, monarch, mo monarch larva monitoring project where we count the uh, number of instars, caterpillars, number of eggs, um, and so on. Um, and so this was for each of our three branches here this past year. Um, and you can see uh, we count about 100 plants a week and we count the number of eggs and instars we see um, underneath on top of the leaves. Um, so it looks like the middle of July was our best uh, time right around that uh, we had the most number of eggs. Um, eggs are definitely the most that we usually see eggs. Um, we don't really see too many in stars, but super cool when you do. And then this here in the top left is the Wisconsin's average. Um, so it looks like, again, we kind of mashed its peak for that middle of July. Um, and then it kind of had uh, a little bit of an awkward bell curve. Um, so pretty cool to see that. Um, let's see how much time. Okay, I was going to show you some of our uh, data over the years, but you actually can find all our data online um, at the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. You can see all the everyone's data from each site. So if you can zoom in on the map to our locations, you can see 2021 through 20, 2008 or whenever we started at Riverside Park. So you can kind of see how things change over time. Um, but I did some of that work for you. Um, and this is a graph of the eggs. My, my Zoom thing is covering the title, so I'm pretty sure this is the eggs I can't tell. Um, uh, and we have Riverside Park in green, Washington Park in, in blue, and Monami Valley in yellow. So you can see a lot of ups and downs at Riverside Park over the years. Um, uh, looks like a general increase for both uh, Washington Park and Menominee Valley. And I took the liberty of, of putting in the R squared values of uh, these trends. And again, the R squared is just kind of like determining the, uh, the variance, the likelihood of, of a trend happening or not. Um, so if you have an R squared value of like 0.9 or higher, you can be fairly confident that uh, uh, it, you could go out 10 years from now and if you have, it, it's going at this linear line, you could say 10 years from now, I can be 90% confident that we will have X amount more eggs or so on and so forth. So for Riverside Park, we have a very low R squared value. So if we were to survey next year, I have zero percent, almost a zero percent chance of guessing at how many eggs we're gonna have. For Washington Park, it's like a 0.4 value, which is not, I'm not too confident. Say for next year, I still don't know how many eggs we're likely gonna see in a season. But the interesting thing for Menominee Valley is that we do have a 0.7 uh, R squared. So it's not great, but it's, it's, it's definitely larger than zero for, for Riverside Park. Um, so that's an encouraging trend to see uh, that the value was put in that the prairies were all started right around 2012, 2013. Um, and so uh, it's kind of showing the, the growth of the park and that we're providing more habitat for uh, monarchs and hopefully other insects and animals. However, the one caveat is that 2013, 2014 was the catastrophic year for caterpillars. So it was a low year overall for everything. Um, so um, uh, you do need to think of that as well, um, that uh, it's, Likely both, it was low years because it was a brand new park and because in general monarchs were low. Um, but it is pretty cool to see that the trend has been going upwards for the most part. Obviously there is a limit and we're not gonna have say 50,000 eggs in year 2100. 
um, in the same area. All right, so here is another graph of the monarch uh, of the instars, not of the eggs over the years. Um, seems the past few years has been pretty, pretty solid, um, but 2021 has been a relatively a rough year. And I'm wondering if that may be due to the relative drought that we've had um, in, in Wisconsin. Um, we didn't really get rain until what, July? Late July or something. So um, pretty interesting to see that. Um, and then, okay, oh man, I have too much to share. Okay, sun angle at solar noon. Uh, if you wanna estimate when the migration is gonna happen, um, at your area, when they're gonna be migrating south, you gotta look at the sun angle at solar noon. So I'm gonna share my screen here. I encourage you to go to this website. Uh, going back to the squeaking beetle page. Uh, okay. If you go to suncalc.org, um, uh, you can estimate when peak migration is gonna happen for uh, the monarch butterflies. Um, uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to type in your location, you're going to put in Milwaukee, and you're going to click on culmination, which basically just sets the, the highest point of the sun, which is here it says 1248, so automatically puts it at 1248. I'm going to select uh, today's date, uh, the 10th, culmination, um, and then you're going to look at what the altitude angle is, and it says 51.62 degrees. And what you're looking for is if you are between 50 to 53 degrees, you are in peak monarch migration for your area. Um, if we go earlier in the year, say to September 1st, we're gonna have a higher angle. We have 54.97. Um, so once you get um, between like 53 to 57, that's the early side of peak migration. And then between 50 to 53, you have that peak migration. And then say, let's estimate what it's gonna be. So we're monarch taking next Thursday. Let's see if we're gonna, what that peak, if we're gonna be in peak migration. That's 49.31. So we're just gonna be just past peak migration late next week um, for Milwaukee. Um, but it's super cool if you wanna estimate specifically for your area, what, when the peak migration is. So again, it's like uh, um, 53 to 57 degrees is the early side. 50 to 53 is peak, and then like 46 to 49 is the late side of migration. So you can calculate it for Texas. If you have friends down somewhere else, you can kind of be like, oh, you should look out for monarchs at this time. Um, all right, back to it. So that's sun angle at solar noon. <laughs> um, here's another little uh, uh, cheat sheet um, that shows one peak migration could be happening, happening for monarchs. Um, and this is telling you the latitude of what it's happening and what time time frame. Um, so latitude already, here we go. Um, so Wisconsin is right between 40 and 45 degrees north. So it's right around like 43. We kind of look back here, right around that. So September 11th is kind of our peak, but between September 3rd and 15th is what they're guessing is our peak migration. And so we're right now in peak monarch migration heading back down south. Um, and um, we hope that you can join us take them. Uh, next week, we have three taking opportunities um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, at our Manami Valley, Manami Valley Branch, Washington Park Branch, and our Riverside Park Branch. Um, and you can help put these uh, tags onto the monarch. It's kind of like their social security number. I'm not gonna talk about it because uh, you're gonna have to come uh, tag them to learn more about tagging, why we do it, um, and such like that. Uh, this is a picture from yesterday um, with one of our volunteers um, that uh, actually it was a viceroy, uh, but uh, uh, it was my only photo I had of someone holding a monarch so or a, a butterfly, so I had to share that one. So with that, I am going to uh, share one last story um, video of what monarchs sound like. My friend who I saw yesterday was also talking about that the thing you don't realize when you're down in Mexico, when, when you're by the, the monarchs, if they're overwintering population, is the sound they make. Um, so if you have time, 
I encourage you to stick with us. Um, and hopefully you can hear this. I'm just gonna click play. I want you to think about the last time you saw a single butterfly flying. You likely noticed its color, but its sound? It's not until you're surrounded by millions of butterflies that you can hear each flapping wing amplified by another. On this morning, this cluster of butterflies is too cold to take off and fly. Butterflies, like most insects, are ectothermic, meaning their metabolism and energy is entirely dependent on the heat of the sun. So they wait the sunshine hitting them and warming up, and we'll sit and wait with them. Ooh, hang on. Okay. Let's get this thing recording. To really hear the sound of millions flying, we'll wait for what we call a waterfall. It's like this. I encourage you to turn your volume up. It may be hard to hear, but you really got to turn the volume up. I'll share the link in the chat after um, for you to listen if you can't hear it, but um, super, super cool uh, sound and it's this it seems magical down there. So with that, thank you for joining and listening about Monarchs. There is so much more to talk about and to go in depth about them. I hope you can join us next year for another lecture on the monarch butterfly. Thank you. <laughs>